for every brute boot of tramp, tramping, the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be turned, burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again um, for your giving of your word uh, and your spirit, which gives us enlightenment and understanding that we might be able to study and to know the mighty things you proclaimed in the ages gone past that are yet to be fulfilled, maybe even in our lifetime. We thank you, Lord, for all that you you accomplished and pray that you give us wisdom and understanding from the sermon this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Early in the prophetic ministry of the prophet Isaiah, the Assyrian Empire was invading Israel. When I say Israel, I mean Israel, the northern kingdom, had turned away from God to worship Baal and other false gods of the nations around them. After they refused to repent and turn from their sins, God brought the Assyrians into the land to destroy them. About this same time, God gave Isaiah the prophecy found in Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. He spoke of one to be born to a virgin and the coming of one who is to sit on the throne of David and rule the kingdom. Not the kingdom of Israel, Samaria, but the kingdom of, with, of Israel with the throne on the throne of David. But the, appear, his, the appearance of this one bearing the names of God was to the land of darkness. And we know in fulfillment, he was speaking of Galilee, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the Galilee of the Gentiles. And it spoke of a time when God would come to visit his people. Isaiah said, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you with joy as at the harvest, for they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor have been broken as in the day of Midian. Every brute of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Isaiah spoke to them of a time when the oppressors would once again be defeated. Israel would be delivered from her enemies. It would be like the days of Midian when God gave them great victory through the hands of Gideon. Then he spoke of this one, the one who caused the light to shine on those who lived in darkness, who was to come with these words, for to us is a child is born, 
to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This coming Messiah will sit on the throne of David to rule over a kingdom that will have no end. Then there were his names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Think about it. The Prince of Peace suggests that he will bring peace and rule with great authority. He is given names associated with only God himself, Everlasting Father, and Mighty God. This one will rule with a rule that will never end and his peace will increase. His government will be extended, his rule. It's not the government of Israel today. That's not the, the throne of David. We know all this speaks of Jesus. In the days of the appearance of Jesus to Gal in Galilee. And part of this prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus began his ministry. But then Isaiah talks about something that we find really hard to understand. Verse 4, For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. As in the days of Midian, every boot of the trampling soldier in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This prophecy hardly fits what was happening at the time of Jesus. The Roman rule was broken, was not broken, and they were not defeated in the days of Midian. As, as it was in the days of Midian. And they were, have not been defeated then or in the years since then, the re, since the resurrection of Jesus. This causes us a few problems for our understanding. What's a prophet talking about? What's he saying to understand, for us to understand that at what time is he talking about what would it be fulfilled? This appears to be a common problem with many prophetic utterances. It's clear in the passage it's talking about Jesus. But at times, the times and the fulfillment seem to be all mixed up as if we were looking at the world through the prophecy and seeing an event in immediate fulfillment and Another part of the prophecy that was fulfilled at a much later time or in ways that we, you do not yet understand. Jesus said, about, said this about his bringing peace to the world from Matthew 10, 34 and through 39. He said to his disciples, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his or mother and a daughter against his, her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father and, or her mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves 
son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. How is it then that he is called the Prince of Peace? When he brings such conflict and turmoil in relationships between people. This morning I was getting ready to leave and I picked up the voice of the martyr. And it's a story about this pastor in Burkina Faso whose village was raided by, by Islamic militants. They murdered his neighbors. His, he fled and hid into the bush, fled out in, from there south to a safe place 25 miles away. This is, this is because of the hatred for Christian people that occurs where there's conflicts between those of Islamic faith and those Christians, in the, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, we find that at least part of the answer that we need to, to understand why is he the Prince of Peace when the, there's so much conflict. Jesus came to bring peace between the fallen race of Adam and God himself. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. He takes up the sins of the world. He is the one who came, the Son of Man, for, and di died on the cross, atoned for our sins, taking away the wrath of God. He paid our punishment for our sins. Thus he made peace between us and God. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of Man. And he is the Son of God. <laughs> he takes away the sins of the world in, in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This pastor in Africa, in his great love for his Lord, is winning converts in the exiles. They're Muslim converts because not all the Muslims were Islamic militant Muslims. So some of them also were killed and persecuted and fled. And now they're hearing the gospel through this very same pastor. Proclaiming to them the Jesus is our peace with God. He is the one who died for our sins. We suffer now in the world because the world still remains in sin and hates those who put their faith in Jesus. But we have peace with God and God's blessing rests upon us. And he has given us his Holy Spirit. As it says in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So Jesus, our Prince of Peace, has brought peace between us and God by his death on the cross. And our faith in him the one who died for our sin. Through him we have been saved. 
it has come about exactly as the angels announced it would happen. Can you remember back on the morning when the shepherds saw the angels in Luke chapter 2, 8 to 14? In this, that same region, the, the shepherds were in the field watching over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear, but the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, they, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And this line I underline. And on earth among those with whom, the, and peace on earth to those with whom he is pleased. Peace. We have peace with God for those who have faith. God is pleased to grant peace to those who put their faith in Jesus. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Exactly as the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We draw near to God through Jesus because he came and died for our sins. And we believe that God loves us because Jesus gave his life. He brings us into a new relationship of grace with God. So what do we say about the passages in Isaiah that talk about world peace? There are still those passages about Jesus that talk about his rule when he sits on the throne of David and of peace that has no end, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And there are other passages that speak about the time when the wars with Israel will cease, not like we hear on the news every night to, when, in Gaza, but it will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and people, many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways, that may we, we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and he shall decide disputes between, for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It speaks of a world peace, a time when, when the weapons of war are, are put back into the fiery furnace and turned into plows, <laughs> turned into hoes, turned into things that we could grow vegetables with. Micah says the same thing. It's not just in one place in the Old Testament. Micah says the same thing. Also, he spoke of the time this one who is coming will bring peace on earth. And in Micah chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. It shall come to pass in the latter days, again, under the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord, mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. 
And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we walk in the paths, in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between peoples and he shall decide for strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall lift up sword against nation. They shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, but we walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Both of these prophecies speak of a time in the latter days yet to come when those who hate Israel will come in peace from the nations. They shall be gathered and they'll go up to the mountain of the Lord in Jerusalem the, as, a, as the center of the earth coming to the Lord to worship and to hear his teaching and his laws and they will be taught by the Lord. They shall no longer make war. They shall exchange their weapons of war for instruments of agriculture. And wherever there are disputes between nations, the Lord will settle those disputes and he will shall judge between peoples and decide justly, righteously between the nations even those great nations far off. It's a great, great time yet to come. I would guess, not that I see, I know the fulfillment, but I would guess this speaks of the millennial reign. <laughs> it could easily be. There is still another peace that the Prince of Peace brings to us who put our trust in him. It's peace in our hearts. The peace that produces uh, an absence of fear. In Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, Paul said this to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You and I live in fellowship with God, and we experience in our own hearts the absence of fear and anxiety. We experience peace as the fruit of the Spirit of God in our hearts. The fruit of the Spirit the, is love, joy, peace, peace, peace in our hearts. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we grow in faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, we grow in the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts, Spirit-filled lives. And Isaiah says in Isaiah 26, 3, he says, Thou dost keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because you trust in him. It's that faith-believing heart that settles our deep fears deep within us where we experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. You don't get it without praying. You don't get it without drawing near to the Lord and without yielding our fears away and saying, no, I trust my God. 
I trust my God. He is sufficient for whatever I need. He is sufficient to take care of this world turmoil and trouble around me. He gives us purpose, perfect peace, the absence of fear and anxiety, stress. Isaiah also speaks about the unbelievers and the wicked in this world. He says that there is no peace for there is only fear and turmoil and anxiety that weighs down the heart. In Isaiah 48, 17 to 22, the Lord himself says this, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am Yahweh your God who teaches you to profit lead you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like its grains and their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. This is late in the book of Isaiah, so he says, Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this and a shout of joy and proclaim it and send it out to all the earth. The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when I led them through the deserts. He made Water flow for them from the rock and split the rock and it gushed out. Speaking of the time of Moses. Then the Lord says, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. And again, late in the book of Isaiah, he says in 50, chapter 57, 16, for I will contend, will not contend forever. It means he will not punish Israel forever. Nor will I be always be angry, for Israel, for the spirit will, would grow faint before me, and the breath of life that I made, because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry and struck him. I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. And then I love the next verse. There, then surprisingly, the Lord says. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. God, our compassionate God of mercy, I will heal him. I will lead him. I will restore him and comfort him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, I will heal him. Peace, in, in Hebrew it's shalom, <laughs> well-being, healing, and peace. And he brought them out from, from Babylon back to the promised land. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up mire and dirt, and there is no peace, says God, my God, for the wicked. So what can we say this morning as we look on the world? I was meditating on this and I said, well, in my short lifetime, there have been many wars and rumors of wars. I was born in 1950, so we had Korea and Vietnam and Cold War and Bosnia and Herzegovina and ethnic fighting and civil wars in various many places around the world and a lot of national uprisings. Wars in the Middle East, in Kuwait, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and wars between communism and the free world, wars between Arab nations and Israel, and the great nations continue to conquer smaller nations, and Russia seeks to rule over the regions of the former Soviet Union. 
And whoever has the latest technology for war gets the upper hand in the latest conflict. There's murder and violence. They continue to dominate the news. The answer to the world and its trouble continues to be one thing. Jesus is coming. The Prince of Peace, the Holy One of Israel, the King of Righteousness, the perfect Lamb of God. Only he can give peace to the world. He does not give peace like the world, who only knows the peace of the bully. When the bully wins, conflicts are suspended, but the fear and the terror reign in the heart. But Jesus said this to his disciples in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you. Let not your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. Luke 12, 32 through 40. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old and with treasure in the heavens that does not fail where the thief, no thief approaches and no moth destroys for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. For us, we have our treasure in heaven we are reassured and assured that we will all be made, it all will be made right in the end, for our Prince of Peace is coming. <laughs> he will judge. We look forward not to this temporary peace, but we look forward to the coming of his kingdom and his rule over the nations to establish peace. And under his rule, the whole earth will experience peace that will never end. The one who gives us peace in our hearts, who has won peace with God for our sins, he is coming again, and he will reign in the end, and there will be no end to his peace, no end to his government and his rule, his righteousness and his justice. His peace that passes all understanding will keep our hearts always as we wait for him. So think about it from Revelations 22, 6 to 21. John said this to the apostle John, or God said this to the apostle Pond. Jesus said, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the evil doers do evil, still do evil. Let the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come and let the one who desires that, to take water of life without price, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, and if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take 
away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And John, the Apostle John says, Amen. And we, this morning, all join our voices this morning and say, Amen. <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. He is coming soon. We have a few conclusions this morning. Let's see what we have. In this world, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Hatred and violence and will increase and love will grow cold. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings peace with God and peace to our hearts that passes all understanding. The Prince of Peace will come and sit on the throne of David and teach the world righteousness. He will settle disputes. He will cause all wars to cease. He brings true peace to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. You are our righteousness. No peace like the peace that you grant to your children who know we are unrighteous, but we have as a gift the righteousness given to us through your righteousness, Jesus, who died for us, washing away all, all our sins. Thank you, Lord, for claiming us as your own, redeeming us, restoring our lives to wholeness and washing in us with the washing of the water of your Holy Spirit and the word. You are at work sending forth in your church the word of God to redeem us and prepare us for heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the amazing grace that you've given us that this could be something that we could experience beginning now through the fruit of the Holy Spirit, peace in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that there is peace and there is an answer for the world's troubles. Thank, help us to be bold and to proclaim your goodness in this time as we get ready for the Resurrection Sunday. Help us as we... Uh, seek you and we seek to, to be your servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.